The headwinds seem to be dying, and gold and silver are both taking off. As gold goes up, it will drag silver with it. This is an inevitability, and silver will break out into some new highs sometime in the near future. It's raining up here in the mountains of Puerto Rico, so please forgive the background noise. This video is about the economy, but more importantly, the economics driving everything that is happening right now. But first, I want to say shame on mass media. You know, I subscribe to probably uh, 20 different publications, and I get their newsletter, which leads to all the different articles that they're publishing. That You know, I've got like Wall Street Journal, Business Insider, Bloomberg, Forbes, uh, and uh, the, um, the publication that is the government mouthpiece for their propaganda, the New York Times and such. And the <clears throat> biggest story has been sort of brushed under the rug. They're all leading with the markets and such. You know, uh, any other story, it doesn't matter uh, what it is, it's some personal interest story or something like that, but the biggest story is still the terrorist attacks in Moscow. Uh, the death toll is now up. Th this Business Insider article uh, has the death toll up at 137. But another article that I read includes the uh, terrorists that were killed, which puts it at over 170 now. It is still the biggest story, and my heart goes out to the people in Moscow uh, this is, you know, it has, this is atrocious. And even if there is a war going on, even if uh, Putin is the bad guy, still, these are just people that were randomly killed. Uh, it's, it's horrible, and the mass media should be ashamed that they're sort of brushing this under the rug. I remember back in 2001, after the terrorist attacks, seeing uh, pictures of uh, people in the Middle East celebrating uh, the, the day that the World Trade Center's towers fell. Uh, and, you know, they should be ashamed, the people that were celebrating, as should we if we're celebrating or brushing this under the rug. But anyway, let's get into the economy. Uh, <clears throat> Nick Gurley uh, shows here that home prices are collapsing and they've crashed by about 20 percent uh, since the peak in 2022. This is big, but this is only the beginning, I believe. Uh, I see sort of a head and shoulders pattern here. Not really, but, you know, it sort of looks like one, <laughs> which is predicting much lower prices. Uh, then moving on, we've got the, uh, the tech bubble. This is uh, tech stocks leading the S&P. So the tech stocks versus the S&P relative prices. And you can see that it correctly calls out the bubbles that were, there was a bubble in 1966. If you check the Dow gold ratio, that's where uh, it peaked. And uh, the, um, the, there's another version of the Buffett indicator that you'll see later that uh, shows that this was a bubble peak. Uh, the year 2000 with the NASDAQ blow-off, the tech stock blow-off, and then now the greatest divergence between these two sectors uh, in history so far. But kudos to, you know, normally I wouldn't say this about a big bank, but Bank of America, B of A, Global Investment Strategies put this chart together. Now, this is the S&P 500 versus tech. The S&P goes only, only goes back to 1950. But jo Dr. Robert Schiller of Yale University uh, took the data for the S&P back much further. And so, uh, obviously, B of A has gone back to 1926 with this chart. And I am impressed because I've done, you know, with my research team, I've done a lot of research on taking databases as far back as possible, and this is not easy to do. Uh, then we've got Warren Buffett's favorite market gauge hit a two-year high, signaling stocks are heavily overvalued and could crash, and that's from Business Insider. And down in the article, they show the chart of the Buffett indicator. 
Notice that this is the um, Wilshire 5000. It's the full market cap index, but it's basically market capitalization determined by uh, the amount of shares that are out there times the price of the share of all of the publicly listed stocks that were in the uh, Wilshire 5000. There's less than, uh, I believe it's like less than 3,500 stocks now that uh, are listed in this because there just aren't, the, there's been so much consolidation of companies that uh, the number of publicly listed stocks is less. It used to be 5,000. Uh, but it shows that it here that it almost hit uh, 200 in uh, 2021, I believe that was, or 2020. Um, but it actually did hit 200. There, notice that this only goes back to 1971. That's because this Wilshire 5000 total full market cap index uh, only goes back that far. But the Federal Reserve, th this is from my book, and this is Federal Reserve data, and they do have a measurement uh, of, and you, if you overlay uh, the Federal Reserve data one with the uh, one that is the normal Buffett indicator of the Wilshire 5000 uh, divided by the uh, GDP of the country, uh, you'll see that there is a, an extremely tight, they almost fall exactly on top of each other with little tiny variations here and there. And the uh, Federal Reserve one goes back to 1947. So what is reality here? Uh, you know, really the economy just doesn't have any business being above, I've said this many times, the, the value of the publicly listed stocks have no business being greater than the size of the economy of the United States, which is the, you know, when that would be in balance is the 100% line here. And you can see the 2000 bubble, the dot-com bubble, the global, the 2008 bubble peak, and where we were back in 2021, <laughs> and it's gotten worse. <clears throat> and, but, you know, I wanted to know when I was writing my book, what's normal? What is like, if, you're, if things have to go back to reality now and then, I wanted to know what is reality. And I had a research team, Alan Hibbard and Tim Burris. Tim Burris is this guy that really goes deep and uh, just doesn't give up and digs up this. I mean, uh, and he had to go really deep for this one. This was an obscure paper by some uh, economists in Europe. Uh, and it was Dmitry uh, Kuvshinov and Kaspar Zimmerman. And they put together this paper and it studies 17 advanced economies from the year 1870. So they went way back. These guys went really deep. And then they produced what's called an interquartile chart. An interquartile chart, they take the data from all of these countries and they uh, bust it up into uh, four quartiles and they eliminate the top quartile and the bottom quartile. And what this does, it gets rid of outliers and it, it fills in uh, gaps in data such as um, hyperinflations, uh, currency collapses, uh, war, things like that. Uh, and then they took all of that data and, you know, I'm going to uh, show you here the United States because I would imagine that there are uh, number, numbers of years here, but kudos to them to be able to take this back from 1947, they took it back to what it looks like uh, 1889, and then there's one data point only before that. Uh, but, uh, like I said, they've eliminated the top 25% and the bottom 25%, so I would imagine a lot of data in what I call the bubble century uh, has been eliminated from their final chart, which was in my book. So this is stock market capitalization to GDP, for, and it's an intraquartile uh, ratio of 17 advanced economies. And so the shadowed area is the 26% um, to 74, 74 or 75%, um, you know, from 20, they've eliminated the bottom 25 and the top 25. So this is the shadow of all of the uh, different countries that are in the middle range. And then this is the median of that shadow. And what you see here 
is what, what's normal in countries around the world, on the average. This is what? This is the 50% of GDP. So this is a, somewhere between 22 and 24% of uh, maybe, maybe 20, 22, 23% of GDP is where the stock market valuation is in balance with the economy. And then we went into the bubble century, is what I call this, where everything is disconnected from reality. And, th and this does not, this only goes to 2018. It doesn't include where we are today. And the United States is up at over 200%. So, uh, or around 200%. So uh, it's, we're still in insane territory. So anybody where that uh, first article said that the, war, that the Buffett's favorite indicator might be pointing out that stocks could crash, I would pay attention to that. Tavi Costa says, meanwhile, uh, we're experiencing record purchases of this pet rock by China. So Warren Buffett's pet rock, the gold, uh, this is, if you recall in the last couple of videos I did, I talked about the arbitrage opportunity when, there's, uh, when the uh, spreads get to where they're paying a lot more in Hong Kong and the Shanghai exchange for gold and silver than elsewhere in the world. It causes flows to go to Hong Kong and China. Now, this is just Swiss gold exports. So this is only uh, exports of brand new stuff out of the uh, Swiss refineries, brand new gold bars from the Swiss refineries uh, into mainland China and Hong Kong. But look at that. Uh, so that Chinese uh, uh, gold rush that is happening right now that I've shown you the videos on, this is what is causing that. Uh, Goldman says that co commodities to gain as central banks cut rates. <clears throat> so actually the reason the commodities are going to be gaining isn't because of rate cuts, it's because of the previous inflation that we've seen. Commodities have uh, been on a tear lately, but they, are, they still have not made up for all of the currency that was created. And this is as commodities gain, and Goldman Sachs says that commodities are going to be in a bull market. Uh, as commodities gain, that means the cost of producing goods go rises, which means there's inflation in your future. Um, and Tavi also points out that this infrastructure spending, if you read this uh, tweet, this is highly inflationary. Um, there, there, and he compares it to 1956, 1945, to 1953, and today. And these are all uh, inflation-adjusted dollars. So we're about to do the greatest infrastructure spending in history. And uh, what he talks about is how this will help drive inflation. And so <clears throat> all of that is paid for through taxes. <laughs> so I just want to show you this little meme. It's a little bit early in this video to be showing a meme. But thanks to Declaration of Memes for uh, providing uh, this great meme of government getting a free ride on the back of the taxpayer. Um, and uh, silver, you know, I've been pointing this out since my first book uh, back in 2008. But silver has not yet exceeded its 1980 high, measured in, in not measured in inflation adjusted dollars but just measured in uh, nominal dollars. Uh, one thing I did notice, uh, this chart was taken from goldsilver.com. You can see our logo down here. They, they put some uh, stuff over the, the top. But um, $50 then, uh, 20, 2021 high, 28.49, so minus 43%. And we're down at uh, $24 or whatever. Uh, it, so it's, it's about minus 50% or so. Well, to get back up to the 1980 high, that means there's got to be a 100% increase in the price. To get, if it's down by 50, to get back up to where you were requires 100% gains. Uh, and so uh, silver has a long way to go. I do believe that we are in for a little consolidation or a pullback, but gold is, is you know, in record high territory. And it is going to, silver always lags. It always lags. 
And what that means is that there's an opportunity uh, to still per make purchases before the big gains come. But as gold goes up, it will drag silver with it. This is an inevitability, and silver will break out into some new highs sometime in the near future. Now, uh, Elaine Diane Taylor. Hi, I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for subscribing and mention that if you'd like to help our channel, please consider my company, GoldSilver.com, the next time you buy precious metals. We're one of the most trusted names in the industry. Our prices are sharp, delivery is fast, and we have an insider's program where you find out exactly what I'm doing with my own investments. Thanks for making GoldSilver.com your dealer. And now, back to the video. Elaine Diane Taylor, a friend of mine, actually. She's uh, uh, been to visit me. I've taken her for rides in my little Tesla Roadster years and years ago. Uh, and she points out that uh, all green again. Now, this, this was done uh, five days ago. Uh, and since then, gold and silver have done a little bit of a pullback. So this one that says today may no longer be uh, green. But 30 days, six months, one year ago, five years ago, 20 years ago, the gains made by gold and silver. Gold and silver are both. Uh, um, the headwinds seem to be dying, and gold and silver are both taking off. Now, as far as Elaine Diane Taylor goes, uh, in the first episode of Hidden Secrets of Money, uh, she, there was a song that she did called Coins and Crowns, and it comes in right at about the 20-minute mark here, 21 minutes, Coins and Crowns, beautiful music, and she gave us permission to use it as the background uh, in the soundtrack for Hidden Secrets of Money, episode one. And here are the lyrics. It's all going down, down, down. The peasants reeling from the games, game of coins and crowns. We're all feeling. When they borrow for war, no gold in store, they just print more. Then our costs go up and our jobs go down. Hunger goes up and hopes go down. The anger goes up and it all goes down, down, down. Gold and silver from the ground, 5,000 years of money found, mine it up, melt it down, a fair exchange to keep us sound, print it up, and it all goes down. And then, uh, several years later, she did one called Helicopter Ben, and Dan, to, we, we got her permission to take the music, and Dan put it to a bunch of images. So if you would like, please go and listen to this, it's wonderful. I want to thank you very much, Diane. And I want to thank everybody for listening and watching. We'll see you in the next video.